Hello, thanks for joining me. We're going to talk today about the role of buildings in a sustainable energy future, and that includes the energy impacts of the built environment. So I want to introduce myself real briefly. My name is Joy Altwise. I'm a program director at Engineering Professional Development at UW-Madison. And uh, a little bit about what I do. Uh, I'm one of the instructors in the Sustainable Systems Engineering Master's Degree Program. And I also run what we call short courses, or non-credit professional development courses, in a lot of uh, different areas. Most of mine are related to my background, which is mechanical engineering, and specifically in the building systems related areas. So, uh, anything to do with energy efficiency in buildings, uh, mechanical systems, different types of equipment, uh, strategies, etc. So that's a little bit about me and let's go ahead and talk about our topic for today. So again, thanks for joining me. In this session, there's basically two parts. So in the first part, it's the big picture. How do buildings contribute to the overall energy use picture? And specifically, we'll look at some of the data from the United States. And then we'll look also at the trends, both in the commercial and residential building market. And then, of course, the second half is how can we improve these buildings? What can we do for energy efficiency? So first, we'll look a little bit about at uh, what consumes energy in our buildings and then some strategies for how we can reduce that energy use. OK, so the big picture energy use in our buildings today. So in this diagram, in this uh, somewhat complicated looking diagram, it comes from the Energy Ad uh, Information Administration from the U.S. federal government. And essentially what we're looking at here are all the energy sources and all the energy uses in our economy. So on the left side is all the energy sources and uh, their amounts in quadrillion BTUs. And on the right side is the residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation sectors of the economy. And what we're going to talk about in this recording, of course, are the residential and commercial sectors. And those are the two sectors of the built environment. Now, if you have an interest in the sources side, one thing that's uh, kind of fascinating to note is that the EIA puts out this diagram every year with uh, the data, and this is the most recent one available as of this moment, and it's the 2018 data. If you uh, take a look back at some of the past years, in fact, I'm going to show you the 2003 data, so a 15-year time gap, and you can compare a little bit about uh, where the changes are happening. Specifically, what I want you to look at are the renewable energy, the coal, and the natural gas on the source side. So again, this is current 2018, and take a look at those numbers. So coal is 15, natural gas is 31 and a half, and renewable is 11.7. That's today. This is 2003. So back in 2003, look how much more coal there was, how much less natural gas, and how much less renewable energy. So again, I'll run that past you again in case you're, you're curious. So again, here's the uh, 2018, the current, and here's 2003. So the difference in 15 years of where our energy is coming from is pretty dramatic. OK, so let's lo look back again at the users. We're going to look at residential and commercial. So those are the four sectors of the U.S. energy users, uh, the four sectors of the economy, if you will, and their total, their share of total consumption. So this data is a little bit newer from 2019, and you can see that residential and commercial buildings represent 39% of the total energy used uh, in the U.S. So th that's where the demand is coming from, 39% of it to uh, residential and commercial buildings combined. So what does that mean in the big picture? Well, over time, what we really need to do is we need to reduce our consumption. If we ever hope to have uh, a sustainable energy future, we need to reduce our consumption. Uh, and here's a diagram from 1950 through uh, about 2019. And the consumption line is the blue line on top. And we've done a pretty good job since about the year 2000 of flattening the consumption line. So we've done a lot of really good uh, efforts in terms of keeping our consumption down, but we're not reducing it yet. And that's where we need to go. We need to reduce our consumption in order to move uh, to a more sustainable energy future. So buildings are a big part of that. They're drivers of both current and future energy sustainability. And 
In terms of retail electricity, not overall uh, energy, just electricity, buildings consume 74% of the uh, retail electricity in the US. Also, it's very similar to the diagram we saw on the previous slide, 39% of US primary energy goes to buildings and that correlates almost directly with the CO2 emissions as well. And one of the little tidbits that most people are not aware of, we can't just rely on building efficient new buildings to create our sustainable energy future. That's not gonna work. The reason why it's not gonna work is because at any one time, and the data here is from 2012, 95% of the existing buildings, 95% are over four years old, which means only 5% are what you would call new, less than four years old. And approximately the other data I've seen is we, we have a replacement rate of one between one and 3% of our buildings every year, and sometimes lower than that. And so it's not sufficient to rely on just building new efficient homes and buildings we have to also pay attention to the existing building stock. We have to make those buildings and those homes more efficient as well. So this is crucial and improving our energy efficiency is not something we can ignore. Uh, it, it's in fact, it's a resource and it's one of the most cost effective resources. It actually pays us back when we invest in energy efficiency. Uh, since 1990, energy efficiency has become the third largest electricity resource in the United States. And what that means in practical terms is that if we had not invested in energy efficiency over all these years, right now, at this very moment, we would need 313 more power plants running. So that's quite a resource. It's kind of strange to think of it that way, but that is essentially what energy efficiency is. It's reducing demand so we don't need additional power plants. If you look at it from a climate change perspective, energy efficiency is one of the big wedges, if you want to call them that, uh, one of the parts of the plan to keep our overall uh, planet below the two degree uh, rise in temperature, uh, the two degree scenario, as they call it. And energy efficiency is not only one of the biggest parts of that plan, but it's also one of the most cost effective parts of that plan. Now, how are we doing with energy efficiency? Well, Emissions from the building sector are not decreasing, not yet. If you look at this chart, and this one is from the United Nations Environment Program and IEA, this looks at from 2010 through 2018, the floor area, you can see how many more buildings we've built. We're, we're continually growing the floor area of buildings in the world. And, and this is a global chart, so this is the entire world and it's much outpacing the population. However, if you notice the energy and emissions lines are not growing anywhere near as fast as the floor area. So that's very encouraging, but that's not going down either. So we need it to go down in order to meet our targets for our climate goals. So it's great that we're not increasing our energy at the same rate as we're increasing our floor space. In fact, the data from 2003 to 2012 showed that floor area went up 22%, but energy use only went up 7%. So that's great. That means that we're making great strides on energy efficiency, but it's not enough yet. We actually need our energy and emissions to be going down. So we face some significant challenges. Uh, one of the data points is that we have, um, we are expected by 2050 to double our floor space. So we're not, we're, we're not stopping construction. We're still building more buildings around the world and our floor space is expected to double by 2050. And again, to meet our climate goals, we can't be increasing our energy use. We actually need to be decreasing our energy use by a, an amount of 3% every year. And that's even including the growth in floor space. So we have to get really, really efficient. And unfortunately, one of the less encouraging data points I've seen from all this research is that recent investment in energy efficiency is slowing down, not picking up. So in the last two or three years, uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, investment in energy efficiency has been slowing down and we actually need to go in the other direction. We need to be putting more, more investment into energy efficiency measures. In part two, let's talk about, can we improve the energy efficiency of our buildings? 
Short answer, can we improve? Yes, we can, <laughs> and we have data to show it. So let's take a look at this chart. This one is from, again, uh, the Energy Information Administration, a U.S. federal agency, and this is from the Commercial Buildings Energy Consumption Survey. That survey is done every few years. Uh, this chart shows the, uh, the 1979 through 2012 uh, range. Uh, the 2018 is not out yet. They're still processing that data. And so if you can see the top line, total consumption over that time frame has gone down. We have made our buildings more and more efficient on a per square foot basis. And you can see the other lines there on natural gas and electricity. And there's an interesting trend happening there. We're using less natural gas in our buildings, in the commercial buildings, and starting to use more electricity. What about homes? So can we make our residences more efficient? Absolutely. Yes, we can. So the number of occupied housing units is in the blue, and this is the uh, companion survey for the residential market from EIA. So this is the Residential Energy Consumption Survey. And the range here is from 1993 to 2015. And we have more housing units, but less energy per household. So we are becoming more efficient on a per household basis. So that's very encouraging. And what makes the difference? What makes one home energy efficient versus another home? What determines whether a building is an energy champ or an energy hawk? And there's quite a few things that go into that. And we'll get into a little bit, uh, kind of start getting into some of the technical stuff uh, that we talk about in our programs and in our degrees. So one of the main things are what they call building heat gains and heat losses. And this is also known as building loads. And I'll use that term uh, as we go forward. So some of the things that determine how much energy is lost or gained in a building include what they call the envelope materials. So what your walls are made of, what your roof and your, your floor is made of. And um, this determines how much energy goes out through the walls or comes in through the walls, whether it's depending on whether it's summer or winter. So those envelope materials, uh, how well they're sealed, the amount of insulation that's in your walls and in your uh, roof uh, and, and other surfaces. Window efficiency plays a big part as well. So again, energy goes out or comes in through those windows and uh, there's a lot of different window choices and some are much more efficient than others. Uh, you've probably heard of double pane, triple pane, coated windows. There's all kinds of technologies that help reduce the amount of energy that's lost or gained through the windows and the doors. In a commercial building, what they call the percent of total area is important as well. And that's how much, uh, I guess it's also important in a, in a home, but usually you don't have quite as much window to wall uh, ratio in a home. Some commercial buildings, uh, there's an awful lot of glass and the glass is less efficient than uh, a traditional wall structure. So if a building has a large percentage of window to wall area, it can be much less efficient than uh, window, uh, a building with fewer windows. Internal gains or internal loads are another one. So anything inside the building that's generating heat. So for example, your lighting, maybe uh, when, you, when you make light, you also make heat. Some of our newer lighting technologies are much more efficient and they're coming down in price uh, quite a bit. So that's helping. And uh, appliances as well, appliances and equipment. So in a home, you'd have appliances like refrigerators, televisions, uh, things, anything you'd plug in and those have efficiency ratings. And uh, required ventilation. Now in most commercial buildings, I think all com commercial buildings, they have uh, code requirements that you must bring in a certain amount of outside air. And this is to make sure that the building is healthy. And that determines a lot of times how much energy that building is going to use. So depending on how much outside air must be brought in, uh, will have an energy impact. So let me explain a little bit about how that works in particular. So an energy user in our buildings is heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, HVAC. So we'll look first at this residential example. So this is what we would consider to be a typical residential furnace system. The compressor is, uh, is sitting on the outside of the building. This is where um, heat is rejected. So imagine during the summertime, you'd have your air conditioner running and that compressor would be rejecting heat to the outside of the building. And everything else you're seeing here on this diagram is inside the building, inside the home. The primary furnace has a fan in it, and it's distributing air throughout the, throughout the 
um, different rooms. That air is passing over heating coils or cooling coils, depending on the season. Uh, they're, they're there all the time, but it depends on which season is determines which one is actually functioning at the time. And it goes out through the ductwork and gets supplied to all the rooms. The thermostat is the control system. It's telling the, the furnace to turn on or off uh, based on the temperature in the room or rooms, depending on how many thermostats you have. And of course, then there are return air ducts that pull the air back to the furnace. So it's a giant loop, if you will. And of course, there's a filter there to make sure the air is clean. So that's your basic residential furnace system. Not all, not all homes have a furnace like this. Uh, some have uh, radiators and boilers and other types of heating and cooling uh, equipment, but this is one of the most common types of residential HVAC systems. Now when you look at commercial, a commercial building has pretty much the same principles, it's just bigger and more complicated. So here let's take a look first at summer. So you can see our fellow uh, outside, he's roasting, it's really hot. So the outside air is very warm. In this situation you have air being brought in. Remember that air has to be brought in. You cannot just circulate the same air over and over again because you will make people sick. So you have to bring in a certain amount of outside air that's required by code. This air is pulled in by the uh, fan in the system. It passes through a filter to clean it and it will go through a cooling coil which is uh, going to bring the temperature down and most likely uh, pull humidity out of that air. If it's gotten too cold because it needs to dehumidify you may have to pass it right back through another heating coil to heat it back up to the right temperature. And then that air is distributed out to the various rooms in the building. And then when it gets to the uh, particular occupied space, as you see here, it may have to be heated up again if it's still too cold. So there may be what they call terminal reheat. And all of this is determined and, and how it's functioning is determined by that thermostat in the space. And then all of that air is drawn back through the system again through the return air system. Some of it's exhausted to the outside and then again some is brought back in through the outside air intake. So this is your summer functioning of a commercial typical HVAC system. So let's look at winter. So if you're in a cold climate and it's cold outside, now you're bringing in very cold air. And again, you have to bring in outside air. <laughs> so you're bringing in this cold air and it's again passing through a filter, but now your cooling coil is off for the season. So you don't have any uh, energy being used by the cooling coil but you are going to be going through the heating coil. Then you, again, the fan is blowing all the warm air out to the various spaces. And if necessary, you could have terminal reheat again at the space. And in the return side of the system, it's not cold air, but it's cooler probably than the supply air. And so that's how it would work in the wintertime. So both residential and commercial, HVAC can be a pretty large energy user. And this is just one example. Um, again, there's lots of other technologies uh, involved in all of these systems, including pumps and fans and uh, control systems, all of which will help determine how energy efficient the system is. Going back to what's making our buildings uh, good performers or bad performers, uh, that ties into the equipment and appliance choices. So all of that equipment, your furnaces, anything inside the building is going to have uh, efficiency ratings, how much energy it uses for what it has to do. And you know you can make good choices on a lot of those things by choosing Energy Star. Energy Star program is a US uh, federal government program and uh, run by the DOE and they rate different types of appliances and equipment for how efficient they are. Plug loads. So a plug load, we've been talking about plug loads. Anything that needs to be plugged into the wall inside of our buildings is essentially a plug load. It's drawing energy. And again, depending on how many of those you have, how many things you're operating at the same time, uh, that's going to determine how much energy you're using. And unfortunately, some of those things draw energy all the time, even when they're not technically functioning. So we call those energy vampires because they're sucking energy even when they're not really doing anything. And so uh, energy vampires is a, a big problem for our, especially our electricity use. 
And then finally, control strategies. This is a big differentiator in terms of which buildings are good and which buildings are not good performers. So control strategies can be used both in residential and in commercial buildings. In a residential building, if you have a programmable thermostat, you have a control strategy you can use because you can program that thing to uh, set back when you're not home so that it doesn't use as much energy. Commercial buildings are the same thing, except they have much more complicated control systems. Uh, they can be set for unoccupied modes, so in the middle of the night, the building's not using as much energy. And they also have you know, options for other things like automatic lighting, automatic dimming. Uh, for example, when you walk into a uh, building uh, with uh, automatic lighting in the bathroom, sometimes you'll notice that the lights come on when you walk in, and that's an energy saving strategy. And there's lots of others. Free cooling is another one uh, where if the outside air is the right temperature, you can draw in 100% outside air uh, through those outside air intakes. Uh, because it's perfect, it's the right temperature. And believe it or not, if you don't set up your control system to do that, it won't. <laughs> so uh, you'll end up using way more energy than you need to. So there's lots of different strategies, especially in the controls world, uh, that can make a huge difference on a building's energy performance. So we need to follow a strategy to make our buildings more energy efficient. So I've got kind of a simple three-part strategy here. First, reduce those loads. Any of those things that can be affected uh, in a new building, you can determine, uh, you can decide to put in more insulation, uh, better insulation, different types, uh, better windows, and uh, there's other strategies such as designing for daylighting, and I'll show you what that looks like on an example coming up. So once you get your loads as far down as you possibly can, then take a look at the equipment you have to get. Do you, do you have choices? Can you buy more efficient equipment? Anything high efficiency is going to make a huge difference in the amount of energy that, you, that you're using. And then finally, if there's any free energy, be sure to take advantage of it. And what kind of free energy is there? Well, this is where it starts to get a little bit down into the weeds on the technology side, uh, especially in the HVAC world. But free energy can be things like waste heat recovery, economizers, and economizer is similar to what I was talking about with using all that perfect outside air uh, when it's just the right temperature. Things like night pre-cooling strategies. If you have good cool night air, you can pre-cool a building so it uh, takes some of the load off the air conditioning later in the day. So these are just examples. There's many, many others. And let's look at this daylighting example. So what in the world is daylighting? So this is an actual building here in Wisconsin. It was built in the mid 2000s. And here you're looking at the south side of the building. So this is facing to the south, both inside and outside of the building. So on the left, you have your outside photo. You can see there's a big overhang at the top near the roof. And this is shading so that during the summer when the sun is really hot and high in the sky, that hot glare does not come directly into the building. But on the inside of the building, you notice they've put a few unusual features. They've got this light shelf here. They call it a light shelf because there's a window above it that's letting in light and that light is bouncing off that white surface up onto the ceiling. Now this allows that daylight to make it further into the interior parts of the building. And at the same time, they also have the windows below for view. Here's that same building, but on the north side. On the north side, you never have any direct solar glare, no hot uh, direct rays of sun. So take advantage of as much light as you can to, to bring it into the building. And you can see both the outside and the inside of the north facing uh, part of the building. And again, as much as possible, they use light colors to allow that uh, light to bounce as far into the in interior parts of the building as possible. Now the way you really take advantage of a daylighting strategy is to not only design uh, the, the building walls and windows appropriately, but also to pair that with automatic dimming of the electric lights. So when there is sufficient light coming in from outside, it doesn't rely on someone remembering to go turn, turn the uh, lights down uh, on the inside of the building. It does it automatically. Now this building did a lot of things, not just daylighting, to make it as energy efficient as possible. If you look at this chart, you notice the tall column. It says, if built to code. That means that if they had built the same building, but only used the required uh, levels of energy efficiency that are built into the local building code, then that was, that's how much energy it would have used. 
the middle column where it says 61.9 that was based on an energy model so when they decided when they decided to build this building they put together the design and they modeled it with a computer and they said hey based on the strategies we want to use which are better than the code minimums we think this building is going to use 61.9 kbtu per square foot when they actually built the building and let it run for a couple years they had metered data so actual utility bills and here you can see it's actually performing even better than they expected by the model so the computer model showed that they were expecting about 50 percent energy savings compared to having built it just to the code required requirements but in fact this building was doing even better it was showing a 57 percent energy savings compared to code and that's at the time that they did the the, the data analysis here now, if you're interested in things beyond just energy, if you're into, into sustainable buildings or, or green buildings, uh, it's important to note that they achieved several other things as well. So this building was aiming for a lead silver, uh, but they earned a gold. If you're not familiar with lead, I'll show you a web link coming up where you can learn more. Construction costs were only $108 per square foot. So this was in the mid 2000s. Uh, that was low for the time. It was especially low now, I think. They also didn't use any high-tech high or unusual type of uh, technologies. Everything's off the shelf. There's a very careful design and well-established uh, goals that helped them achieve uh, what they did. And their energy savings goal was 55% better than that code-compliant building, that first column on the previous slide. And their real-world real savings have been higher than that. Uh, the, the diagram showed, uh, I believe it was 57%. They have had years where they have been 65 plus. So great things are possible. We can do amazing things with our buildings. And it doesn't even require us to do anything wild, crazy, or expensive. However, we have to do it one building at a time. It's such a challenge. There's so many buildings and, and so many new ones being built. Is there anything we can do to, to move this along a little faster? So yes, there's a few things that we can do on a kind of a society-wide uh, approach. One of the things is to encourage change through policy. So if you work in the policy world on the government side, for those who write laws, make laws, or advise them, there's a few ways to incentivize the building sector. Uh, not only the builders, but the owners. Uh, you can, for example, some of the new policies I've seen, fast tracking permits for, for projects that are going to use high efficiency technologies or they're going to go after a green rating. They can reward it directly with financial incentives such as uh, tax rebates, uh, dollar rebates for choosing efficient equipment, for example. And then another approach is to mandate it, to make it required. For example, by implementing more strict or newer building codes. The other thing that we can do is to focus on changing our buildings from users of energy to suppliers of energy. And this is already happening and it's very exciting. So. A lot of new projects are aiming for net zero, and what that means is they're trying to make their buildings uh, net zero on an annual basis. So if they have, they, they try to get their energy use as low as possible, but then they add renewable energy to the building itself, usually solar panels or wind turbines, and produce as, enough energy to offset their entire utility bill for the year which is really exciting and we're and we're seeing many more buildings doing this but you can go further you can produce power you can get the get to the point where on an annual basis you're exporting more energy than you're using from your building and so you're exporting that extra energy back to the utility grid and that's a very exciting development and we're starting to see that in uh, several places so it's happening now and there's uh there's lots going on so I hope I've inspired you a little bit. There's lots of places where you can go to learn more. Uh, I've got some websites here. Passive House is a uh, program for building extremely energy efficient homes. Uh, LEED, I mentioned earlier, is run by the U.S. Green Building Council. Uh, the Living Building Challenge is always a great place to go look at what's possible. And then, of course, if you're interested in the building codes world, 
energycodes.gov is a great website from the federal government giving you updates on uh, the code status in all the different states. Case studies, I highly recommend you take a look at some. Some, A lot of them are extremely inspiring. And there's tons of different websites with case studies, and here's just a few. So feel free to check those out. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this tech talk. Again, this was produced by UW-Madison Engineering Professional Development, where I work. And if you'd like to learn more about this or other topics, please do visit our website at epd.wisc.edu. If you'd like to know more about the Sustainable Systems Engineering Master's Degree, that's an online master's degree and the link is here. And we also have other online master's degrees and uh, you can check, them, uh, check out all of them at the, the web link shown. Thank you very much.